morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Vintage Church North. I hope everybody's doing well today. Uh, we're glad to have you here in Trinity Academy's gymnasium and those of you who are online worshiping with us today. Uh, we're so glad to have you here. Uh, if we've not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Jordan Woodard. I'm one of the pastors here at Vintage Church North. Uh, and we here at Vintage, we are a church for doubters, seekers, and followers, and we exist to make much of Jesus. Uh, and we do that by being disciples who make disciples who know, live, and advance the gospel. Uh, so what that means in our day today, and you'll, you'll hear me say this many Sunday mornings, what that means is whether you're here with us and you've been worshiping with us for years or, or maybe you're new, maybe this is a first, a second, or a third time, and you're just coming to see what, uh, what this church is about, like who this Jesus guy is, uh, this is a place for you. Uh, this is a place that you can belong. This is a place that you can bring your doubts, that you can bring your questions, that you can bring the messy aspects of your life. Uh, this is a place you can call home. If you are new with us today, if you are one of those folks that maybe it's your, your first, second, or third week, uh, I'd like to invite you to do what we call sticking six. And, and many folks that you meet here at Vintage Church North and, and actually across the other Vintage churches in the Triangle area will tell you that they started out their time with Vintage sticking six. And, and what that means is, is give us six weeks. So, so six weeks, including today, is from now until March 24th. So give us those six weeks and, and take that time to, to find out more about who we are. Uh, get plugged in with some of the things we have going on, whether it's a, a men's gathering or a women's gathering or a Wednesday morning prayer. Get, get plugged in with some of the things that we're doing um, and let us have a chance to get to know you, uh, to, to get to welcome you into this family, to get to tell you our, our stories uh, and our histories and, and, and what uh, Jesus Christ has done for us in our lives and, and many of us through this church. Uh, if you are one of those folks uh, who are new this morning, um, one great first step in, in us getting to know a little bit more about you is when you came in on the right, there's a table that, uh, that has quite a bit of information. Uh, if you're new, please do stop by there, check out what we have, grab one of the welcome bags. Uh, it has some information about who we are. Uh, but if you fill out a connect card and, and just give us a little bit of information about how we can reach out to you, uh, we'll send us a little bit about how you can get plugged in here. Uh, and um, we really hope that you'll, you'll take an opportunity and do some of those things. All right, y'all, if you're able, please stand with me this morning as we enter into our call to worship. And our call to worship today comes from Psalm 139, and it says, Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shield, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Let's sing and worship together our great God this morning.
part of our, our Sunday morning worship service, we, we take a time to pause. Uh, we, we, we sit still for a few moments in our service. And while worshiping our God, we, we catch a glimpse of, of, how far, of how far we've fallen short of his holiness and his righteousness and, and God's justice. And we see how we've missed the mark, how, how we have sinned, how our hearts have, have turned away uh, from a God who has chased after us for us to chase after foolish things. We see our sin and all of its treason and, and all of its ugliness laid out bare before us. But the good news of the gospel is that God has not left us to the destruction of our sins. That God the Father sent his son Jesus that through his perfect life and his death on a brutal cross and his resurrection on the third day, that our sins may be forgiven if we turn away from them, if we repent from them and turn toward Jesus Christ and place our faith in him. So this morning in these few quiet moments, take, take some time, take some time to quietly confess those sins before our loving Father. merciful Father. Lord, you forgive all who turn away from their sin and turn to you. Father, we confess this morning our many sins and we humbly ask for your mercy. Lord, we have not loved you with our whole heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves as you have commanded. Father, we have often not done justice, Lord. We've, we've not loved kindness and Lord, we've not walked humbly with you. Have mercy on us this morning in your loving kindness. Lord, in your great compassion, wash us clean from our sin. Create in us a clean, pure heart and renew a right spirit within us. 
restore to us this morning the pure joy of your salvation and sustain us for the rest of our days with your life-giving spirit. It's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray together this morning. Amen. Vintage Church North, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ this morning, Psalm 103 says this about you. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. If you've placed your faith in Christ Jesus this morning, your sins have been freely and joyfully forgiven. Let's greet one another in that joy and forgiveness this morning. Our tears. Oh, good name. 
Brought us straightening to our knees Then we cry like drunken sailors To the only one who hears And the God of comfort took away our tears Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Good morning. Uh, the reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. And if you're a kindergarten for fifth grade, you may leave by the atrium. Thank you. That music makes me want to just like fight. <laughs> Sorry, I know it's not the best way to start, but it is. Like I'm pumped. Like I want to get into battle with somebody. Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Chris Freeman. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. Probably shouldn't have been talking about fighting as I'm meant to be professional. Uh, so please forgive me for that. Uh, I've been away for a few weeks. Uh, I've had the privilege to go out and visit some of the other vintage congregations, and I just wanted to say that it's good to be home. Um, I missed you guys. There is something special uh, that I just wanna spend a moment to encourage you in about the way that North uh, conducts itself. Like, North folks are just hospitable people, and uh, I wanna thank you all for being the way that you are, for responding in the way that you do, for welcoming people uh, into this church. Uh, it means a lot, um, not saying that other congregations aren't like that, I'm just saying there's just something very special about here that I'm very appreciative of. So thank you guys. Um, I also wanted to say, uh, if you're new, thank you for being here. Thank you for following that poll uh, that was placed on your heart this morning. Uh, it's no coincidence that you're here today. Uh, you're right where you need to be, and I pray... Um, just that you experience the love of Jesus this morning, that you, this morning is full of peace and full of hope and that you're able to see just so clearly 
that you are deeply and deeply loved, and that Jesus is, in fact, worthy of your life. Um, you're welcome here, and uh, if you're new, I just want to say very boldly that you belong here. Uh, to help you get acclimated, we've spent the past few weeks in a series entitled Being the Church. If you missed any of the past sermons, don't worry. Uh, we're aggressive in how we put that information out. Uh, you can check out the North Facebook page. You can check out Spotify. You can check out all these different things. That We have an app we don't talk about often, but we have one. Um, so just check that stuff out. It's literally everywhere. Um, in this series, we've explored topics like the importance of gathering together on a Sunday, the importance of serving in church and in the triangle, uh, living in community, and giving out of a joyful generosity. This week, we're talking about love one. And for those of you who have never heard that term before, love one simply means having one person in your life whose salvation you're praying for and with whom you're looking for intentional opportunities to talk about the hope of the gospel. Today's sermon will be rooted in Matthew 28, uh, the Great Commission, but it will also primarily include my personal testimony. Uh, and I hope that's okay. I know it's not standard. It's not the average approach from the pulpit on a Sunday. But the subject is deeply personal to me because I am someone's loved one. Through the intentionality, through the love and care of one person, I was shown the beauty and majesty of Jesus. So hang with me. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll spend about 30 minutes or so resting in Matthew 28. Let's pray. Gracious God, we praise you. We love you, and we confess that we need you. We need your patience, your kindness, your mercy. We just need all of you. Cover us in your grace this morning and allow us to see the beauty and truth that you've prepared for us. Allow us to experience the power of your word. Help us to know that you're with us and that the Holy Spirit is here in this room. Draw us closer to you today. And please guide me this morning. Allow me to be obedient to your will. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, excuse me, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There's a, a lot packed into these few short verses. We have a mission statement uh, to go to make disciples of all nations, all peoples, and to baptize them in the name and the authority of our triune God. We're to share the teachings and good news of Jesus with everyone the Lord brings to us, trusting that Jesus is with us for the rest of our days. The way that we should live our lives in response to Jesus' great love and sacrifice for us is written in this text. There's so much here, and you don't really need to break it down all that much to see what the call to action is. But still, one of my favorite things to do is to look for simple language, especially the simple language that describes how Jesus engages and interacts with people. Like it's all over the Gospels. Descriptors like Jesus seeing people, speaking to people, touching people, knowing people. It's easy to look past it. Like, well, obviously Jesus had to see and speak people, which, yes, valid. But when you slow down and wrap your head around it, the idea that God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to walk among us, to speak to us, to listen, to be with us, to ultimately save all who place their hope in him, it's an overwhelming thought. The movements of Jesus are these larger-than-life movements, but even miraculous moments carry some simplicity in them. Nearly every miraculous encounter of Jesus 
healing people, it begins with him setting eyes on them or reaching out his hands to touch them or simply opening his mouth and speaking. For example, before Jesus healed the leper, a miraculous moment in Matthew 8, the text says that he stretched out his hand and touched him, simply touched him, which for the leper was not simple. And it was unheard of because his condition, his condition meant that he was untouchable. Before Jesus heals the paralyzed man in Luke 5, you know, the man who was lowered down to him on a bed through the roof by some folks, says that Jesus saw their faith. And in John 5, at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus was surrounded by people in need of healing, but the Bible says that he saw one man in particular who had been there for 38 years, paralyzed. Jesus saw him lying there and knew his condition, and then he speaks to the man before he heals him. These moments, they're over-the-top amazing but they begin with something that doesn't take heavenly power or divine intervention to do. And to me, that's incredibly encouraging to consider. We don't need to be able to perform miracles to engage people on behalf of Jesus. We just need to do what Jesus does at the very beginning of Matthew 28, verse 18. We just need to come close and speak. In today's text, it finds Jesus and his remaining 11 disciples on a mountain in Galilee. The disciples had witnessed Jesus being betrayed, giving himself over to authorities. He was crucified, died, and was then buried in a tomb with a huge stone covering the gravesite. But there he was, right in front of them, in full resurrected glory. And verse 17 says that when the disciples saw Jesus, they worshiped him. But it also says that some doubted. Some couldn't wrap their heads around what they were seeing and experiencing. And it's in this mixture of overwhelming emotion that Jesus draws near to his disciples and speaks to them. Oh, I'm, a, uh, I'm an only child. And I didn't have a, a ton of friends growing up. Like I had some. Don't get me wrong, but like I wasn't the, the popular kid in class. Uh, I don't really know how to be the popular kid in class nowadays with everyone wearing sweatpants and hoodies, but when I was in school, you, like, you were judged by what you wore. The popular kids were preppies, and I was no preppy. Preppy, head-to-toe, polo, Tommy Hilfiger stuff. You, we, we good? Um, I, however, dressed like a skater, uh, I was not a skater, though. I was into BMX, which is bicycle motocross. And to clarify, not motorcycles. That is way too cool for me. Pedal bikes. <laughs> Pedal bikes. The clothes for a BMXer were nearly identical to skateboarders. Big baggy pants, chain wallets, ball chain necklaces, ear pierced, long hair. The Jinko Nation. You tracking with me? Okay. <laughs> oh, I got to I know. Yeah, okay. Uh, in my case, these kinds of clothes, uh, they were accompanied by a pretty bad attitude, and I had the worst attitude. Um, I was not the friendliest to be around. I was not easy to approach. But one day, this kid comes close, and he comments that he likes a shirt that I was wearing. Now, this kid was an anomaly because he was liked by everyone. He was in with the jocks, the preppies, the skater kids, the smart kids, everybody. And we started talking and quickly became friends. Uh, this guy's name is Jim, and to this day, some 20-odd years later, he's still my best friend. But for whatever reason, on that day, he saw me. He came near and spoke to me. Jim took the first step and engaged me. And on the mountain in Galilee, Jesus takes the first step and engages his disciples. He meets them where they are, in the middle of worship, in the middle of doubt, and coming near, he speaks. As a believer, I want to take note of this posture. 
I want to engage people how Jesus engages people. To do that, though, I need to understand that folks are dealing with all kinds of stuff, and we can't hold the expectation that they will be ready to come to us in our space. Not everyone um, is ready to bring themselves to church on a Sunday. So we need to step into their world. We need to enter into their excitement, into their struggles, their hopes and dreams, their anxieties and depressions, their belief, their doubt. We need to be prepared to walk boldly towards people, regardless of their current situation, trusting that Jesus will provide the opportunity, trusting that Jesus is in control, Trusting that when Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, that it's his strength that we cling to. Jesus' strength. It's his authority. The success rate of loving other people effectively depends on our reliance on Jesus. Because some people are dealing with stuff that's far beyond our scope of understanding or control or even our comfort level. We need Jesus' boldness. We need to be grounded in his authority. When I um, hit high school, my life took a a serious turn for the worse. My, My parents separated, and I found comfort in places that I shouldn't have. To be really frank, I developed a substance abuse issue. I fell into addiction at a really early age, and my life revolved around it. And to top it off, I still had that bad attitude. I was fairly difficult to be around. I had significant anger issues and a dangerously strong desire to flee from most of what life threw at me. To sum it up, I lived without hope. I lived without love, and I was an outcast who longed for life to just be over already. I didn't see the point in much, but Jim stuck with me. He saw something that I couldn't see. Home life was hard. It was not good for me to be there. So Jim and his family, they took me in. They let me stay over any time I needed to. They fed me, they cared for me, they laughed with me, they accepted me. They met me where I was and made a place for me. And I'd never experienced anything like that before. So the bad attitude crept in and I got skeptical and I got curious and wanted to know why. And turns out what made them different from other people was that they were the only believing family that I knew of. I was welcome there anytime, but a condition for staying over on a Saturday specifically was that I had to go to church with them the next morning. That arrangement seemed pretty fair, especially because they sweetened the deal with this like massive pancake breakfast, sausage, the juices, all the stuff. And looking back on my time with them, their love for me was beyond generous to the point where it was fairly unreasonable. I had issues and wasn't easy, but they treated me like I was meant to be there and seemed genuinely happy when I was. To this day, they still refer to me as one of their sons. In a season where my home life was falling apart. They let me be one of their sons. They loved me with a beyond generous, overwhelming, unreasonable, reckless love of Jesus. They spoke truth into my life and they were gracious with me and they showed me mercy. Friends, they showed me Jesus. And looking at it now, I think the reason why this family had such a huge impact on me was because 
everything that they did was in response to the overflow of Jesus's great love for them. It wasn't motivated by the movement, or excuse me, it was motivated by the movement and authority of Jesus in their lives. They weren't afraid of me. They didn't try to change me in order to love me. They just loved me. And I needed changing, don't get me wrong. But their love for me wasn't conditional. It was firm and constant. I didn't deserve it, but they gave it freely. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but every move they made, every conversation, everything functioned like this crash course lesson in showing me Jesus. Like, they were never explicit about it. You know, like I'm cooking you pancakes because Jesus would want me to cook you pancakes. Like they cooked me pancakes and allowed me into their lives because Jesus pursued them when they were brokenhearted, when they were beaten down and showed them compassion extending forgiveness and mercy and healing at every twist and turn. They were teaching me through their words and actions and experiences about the ways of Jesus. And now this is what love wants about. Showing people Jesus through our attention and intentional care for them. It's so much more powerful than speaking at people. It's about being with people. I slipped further and further into the dark parts of my life. So much so that I was engaged in things that most people don't recover from. And uh, a lot of my friends died. I've buried more friends than, um, than I'm comfortable talking about. And it was just a matter of time before I was next. So, uh, so I got scared, like really scared. Uh, so scared, in fact, that one day I was in my, my early 20s and I fell on my knees and prayed to God. Didn't really know what I was doing. It just came out. And I said, God, if you're real, I need help. In church, God showed up and did just that. Like things changed rapidly. Now, I, I need to be really careful because I don't want what I'm about to say to come off like some kind of health and wealth gospel. You know, believe in Jesus and you'll have the big house on the block with the jazzy car and shop clo sharp clothes. Your hair will be perfect and your muscles will be huge. <laughs> what I'm about to say is not health and wealth. It's death to life. And that's how dire things were for me. I was dead and Jesus was breathing life into me. And by the grace of God, I was able to shake off habits without much effort at all. I stopped running with people that were bad for me. I had this newfound desire to go to church, not because of pancake bribery, but because I wanted to be there. So I called Jim, again, the only believer that I knew of, and he was going to Vintage at the time, and he invited me. I loved it. Your hospitable nature to a kid who felt like an outcast like just you being the way that you are makes people feel at home. And I needed that. I needed a home. And God gave me one through Vintage Church. Uh, I, I got a job at the YMCA. And it was through that job that I found that, hey, man, I'm, I'm good at stuff. I can contribute. I have value. Uh, Jim introduced me to Caitlin. And Caitlin gave me the gift of knowing what it's like to be unconditionally loved. Later on, I got invited to work here at Trinity. And that job allowed me to understand what it was like to work for a living. 
but then to use those resources to take care of my family, to love sacrificially. I worked here for almost 10 years, all the while attending church on Sunday, hearing more and more about who Jesus is and all that he's done for me. God was just reorganizing my life and giving it a purpose. And one morning at Vintage Midtown, uh, it used to be North Midtown, became North, anyway. Pastor Tyler Jones came and preached on Ephesians 1. And my eyes were open. I'll go further and say my brain exploded. Like it all clicked. I'd lived my whole life in shame and regret, like this angry darkness, feeling broken and unlovable. But it was that morning where I heard how Jesus felt about me. I heard that I've been blessed in Jesus Christ with every spiritual blessing in heaven, that I've been chosen, deemed holy and blameless. I've been adopted into his heavenly family according to his will. I've been redeemed and forgiven. Grace has been lavished on me. I've been united in him and all these truths have been sealed within me by the Holy Spirit. This is how Jesus feels about me. But this is how Jesus feels about you. You are fully loved. Hey, buddy. I gave my life to Jesus that morning. And shortly after, Midtown held a, held a baptism Sunday. And outside in the freezing cold and a pop-up hot tub looking thing, I stood in the frozen water waiting to be baptized. And who was there to lower me under the water, baptizing me in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Pastor Tanner and Jim. My life has been forever changed. And now instead of looking on my past and being overwhelmed with shame and regret, God has recycled my brokenness and uses it for his glory. In this pastoral role, I have the privilege of being invited to listen to the full scope of people's stories, to the best parts and the darkest parts. And often I, get, I can do so without batting an eye because man, I've been there. But not only have I been in the darkness, I've been rescued from it. And I get to point people to the rescuer. And so can you. You don't need to be a pastor to share the greatness of Jesus with people. You just have to show up and speak. For all who follow Jesus, there's no doubt that he's moved in your life in some form or fashion. So let's talk about it. Not every story has to be my story. It doesn't have to be this over-the-top thing. My wife's story is drastically different than mine, and praise God for that. But she is used regularly as she speaks life into my heart, as she serves as a nurse, as she cares for our children, as she leads Norse prayer team, and countless other things. You have a testimony worth sharing. You have so much to offer. Just point to Jesus and watch how he uses you. So let's break this all down for a second. Jim and his family, they seized an opportunity that was revealed to them. So what's your opportunity? Who is the person in your life? The person in the neighborhood, at work, the family member, the regular at the gym, the whoever, that you regularly see who is that person? Because that's your person. So how do we bridge that gap? First, we pray like crazy. We pray for a person to pop into your life. And when they do, we pray for the wisdom and courage to approach them. Then we commit to praying some more. 
and we pray for that person by name. And through prayer, we verbally entrust them into our Heavenly Father's care. I use an app called, uh, a prayer app called Echo. It's brilliant if you need help. I highly recommend it. Second, uh, we see the person. Like, really see the person. To see their condition, see their wants and their needs. We see the parts of them that Jesus can redeem and restore. And then we pray some more that we'll have compassion. Third, we come close. We engage with them. And this is the scary part. But this is an opportunity to rely on Jesus. Matthew 28 says that it's out of his authority that we are to go and make disciples. We cling to his strength, his intentionality, his power, his purposes, his everything. And we have access to it all through the Holy Spirit. John 16 says that the helper, the Holy Spirit, will be sent to us. We have Jesus' seal of approval and the Spirit to see this through. All we have to do is trust in Jesus and move obediently towards people in hope that they will come to know his saving grace. And lastly, we seize every opportunity to display and share the Father's goodness. Let's speak to his faithfulness. Let's carry it across the street and around the world. We've been called to respond in this way, to engage our neighbor on behalf of Jesus, to tell the story of how he rescued us, to point people to the hope that we have in him, that we were once separated, but the Father in his great mercy towards us sent his son Jesus to bridge the gap, to do what we were unable to do on our own so that we can approach God in worship, awe, and wonder as reconciled people who are accepted. We don't have to be afraid. We walk in the full confidence of the Lord, trusting that his plan has come to fruition. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's believe Jesus when he says that he will be with us until the end of the age. You are not forsaken. You are a precious son or daughter of God. And he's been so good to us. Like This joy is worth spreading. So we pick one person, we love them on behalf of Jesus, we invest in them, and we look for every gap that we can fill with the glory of God. Your efforts are worth it. The gospel that you believe in has the power to transform lives, and I'm living proof of it. I tell you my story not so you can see how great things are going for me right now. Like, life is hard, y'all. It's still hard. But I tell you the story so you can see how great and faithful our loving God is. So with that, we go, and we share the good news of Jesus. We make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's make much of Jesus. He is very much worth it. Let's pray. Gracious God, we need you. We need you to unite us, to guide us, to shine your glory through us so that we may be one as you are one. Give us the courage to take a chance on one another, to show up in our brothers and sisters' time of need, ready to lend a hand in love. Allow us to be gracious with one another, showing mercy just as you've shown us mercy. Show us how to love out of a place of compassion 
not obligation. Help us to shine your light on the darkest parts of this world. And give us the courage and strength to do all of these things according to your will, out of your power, so that you receive all the glory. Let us do all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So we respond uh, in a few different ways. First, we take communion. Uh, in a moment, during this next song, a few people will come forward with bread and juice. And the bread representing Jesus' body that was given for you. And the juice representing his blood that was shed for you. You don't have to be a member to take communion. We just ask that you are a follower of Jesus. Second, we give there's some instructions on the screen on different ways that you can give, either online or through the box in the atrium. But we give not out of an obligation, we give out of an overflow of the generosity that's been poured onto us. Third, uh, we pray. Kimberly, Peter Kuski, and I will be in the back over there, ready and willing to pray for you. If there's something that's uh, been placed on your heart today, please come back and let us lift it up to the Lord on your behalf. We're not going to counsel you. We're just going to pray for you. Uh, and with prayer, there's something extra to consider this week. Out in the atrium, there's a green love one card. And we invite you to put someone's name on it and to develop a rhythm of regularly praying for them. Let it be someone that you're committed to having gospel conversations with in hopes that they'll one day turn to follow Jesus. Those cards are yours. We're not asking you to turn them in. We just hope it serves as a welcome reminder to pray and to be bold. And lastly, we sing. We respond in songs of praise worshiping our great God that has been so kind and generous to us. So church, if you'll stand, let's turn to Jesus and respond in praise.
retreat is coming up February 22nd to the 25th and I've heard that there are six spaces still left if you would like to go so if that is you if you are interested in going the 22nd to the 25th speak to Kimberly Kimberly's waving her arm she can't wave both arms she's got a baby in the other arm she's waving her arm and got the baby all right see Kimberly if you are interested she can let you know uh, what information she needs to get you plugged in uh, and our, our men's gathering is tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m. And uh, see John and or Luke. I don't see John anymore. He was up here. John's back there. John's in the back. Luke's up here. So wherever you are, there's somebody close. See John or Luke to find out more information about that gathering. All right, y'all. Our benediction this morning uh, it comes from 2 Corinthians 13, and it says, Finally, brothers, rejoice. 
aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Vintage Church North, go in peace.